Hi, I'm Seamless, and today is Monday, which I'm, I'm forever just going to say what day it is when I start doing a thing, because that's what I do, but that is increasingly having less relevance into what the video actually is. That was originally the purpose of me doing that, by the way, it was me being like, today is this day, so it's time for this thing, and really the only thing that I actually keep up to a schedule that actually stays to be on the day is essentially how to base, which happens on Fridays. And sometimes I even forget to do that, but um, it used to be that I'd have like a a show on every day. And like the, like it used to be like Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays was FL Basics, which I just kind of fell off. And then like Sundays there'd be a stream, and then Mondays there was the game streams when I would play video games on the other channel that died. Um, and then Fridays would be Pad to Base. But I just kind of stopped doing that. And so now it's just sort of back to the original, original schedule, which is whatever I can do, whenever I can do it. Except for how to bases, which I do on Fridays. So it's kind of like my main thing anyway, so I guess it's really fine if I do that. Anyway, today is going to be about music theory. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is the spiel that I give to actually the, the students. Actually, a, a lot of the production basics that I, uh, the video series that I do, uh, is essentially born of conversations that I have with students a lot. So I figured that it's pretty good to have these out here as videos just so that like if uh, people don't want to pay me pay me money to have me talk at them individually, they can watch the videos and that'd be just fine. Um, but yeah, let's talk about what I mean by that because it's it's, it's a very it's specific it's a specific spiel. It's born of my experience plus a little bit of my actual education that I've had in music theory, but it's not super complete. It's not like the a, it's not an entire look at all of music theory. Only really what I've found to be relevant in my personal experiences. If you find it to be lacking, I completely agree that it is. And that there are other resources that you can find to sort of talk about uh, similar um, similar things that you can do. Uh, for example, uh, Varian, Varian's YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Varian official, has lots of uh, decent music theory uh, lessons and tutorials and stuff. And those have, been, those have been where I've sent people in the past to sort of do that kind of thing. But let's actually, I spend a lot of time talking about stuff that's not about what I'm talking about today. So let's actually do a thing. Um, music theory and music in general is at the, 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 the lowest level that I'm going to talk about is born of this idea of scales. And a scale is essentially uh, where you determine, like, like essentially you determine what notes you're going to play in all of the whatever track you're making. You can, there are exceptions, and actually pretty much everything that I'm going to tell you is only really a suggestion. Music theory in general is really just a suggestion. It's pretty good suggestions, born of hundreds of years of experience with music writing, but uh, it's really still just a suggestion. In the end, a lot of people get away just fine with doing what they think sounds good. And this is primarily for those who are tired of doing that and or don't really have an idea of where to go when they're starting tracks. So they like to have guidelines to kind of guide them towards general goodness without, uh, you know, being too lost. And then you can, you know, if you get then if you get ideas, you can break away from whatever I'm about to talk about and you'll be fine. Yeah. So the scale. Um, if you've ever looked at a keyboard, the piano roll, for example. Um, and you've talked and you consider the idea of scales, you've probably uh, come to the conclusion or have been shown the conclusion that if you play all the white notes from C to C, you get the major scale. Ta-da! So here's the major scale. Now, um, the major scale, and, and really any scale, is determined by the spacing in between the scale degrees. Now, what are scale degrees? The scale degrees are a fancy way of uh, calling uh, the actual sequence of the notes in the scale itself. So for example, this is the first note in the scale, so it's considered the one, or the root, or the tonic. Then there's the two, the three, the four, the five, the six, and the seven, and then the one again. There's not really any eight. However, if you ever hear anyone talking about like nines or elevens and that kind of thing, they're talking about essentially just continuing the, the scale. So the nine, the 10, the 11, that kind of thing. That's what they're, that's, that's what they're talking about. Um, but really it's just one to seven. That's the scale that we got. There's all, there are, there are actually fancier names for them. Um, I don't remember what they are, but I did learn them once upon a time. It's not super, super important. It's kind of interesting though. If you're into, if you're into that, there's plenty of resources online for Googling this kind of stuff. Um, but yes, yeah, so we get that sort of, that sort of, 
that those are the naming conventions for that itself. For anyone, whenever you hear someone say like they're going to make a chord using the one, the three, and the five, they mean the one, the three, and the five, and you get a chord. Um, but if you look at the the scale degrees, you see that there is a sort of a there's sort of a it's, it's actually this is this is especially clear if you look at it in terms of the piano roll where every note is given even spacing. What I mean by that, if you look at an actual piano, all the white keys are kind of together flush, and then the black keys are in the middle of them. But if you look at look at it on a piano roll, every key is given the equal amount of space. So then it becomes super apparent, for example, that C to C on all the white keys has different kind of spacing from one note to the next. And this is what determines the, the sense of what the scale is. In real music theory, they refer to these as whole steps and half steps. A whole step is essentially two half steps. And a half step is just a step to the next note be it a white note or a white note or a black note. But um, yeah, so the major scale in real music theory, what they would do is either have you memorize the uh, the order of whole steps or half steps to determine what a scale is. So major scale will be whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. That'd be, that'd be what they would tell you to do. And that's a reasonable, you know, uh, method of learning something, especially because um, unlike... <laughs> Like actually, like there's, there's there's a lot of parallels between math and music in terms, especially when we're talking about music theory. But actual math tends to be endless, where memorizing individual facts about things tends to be not as efficient as just memorizing a solution to everything, like a, an actual equation that defines whole sections of things. But that's not super relevant in music theory, where there really are only so many of things, and especially in scales. And now. This is, you know, the minor scale, major scale. But I, I started with the major scale, but that's not really, you know, super duper common in terms of the music that we tend to make. And, you know, the electronic EDM kind of uh, that sort of deal. Even like metal, pop, major is pretty rare. But uh, what we'd like to do is minor. How do we determine that? Well, we can either remember what the difference of the order of whole, whole, whole steps and half steps is. Or we could use another modal technique. But what do I mean by that? Well... Remember how we said the white keys from uh, C to C is major? Well, if we do the white keys from A to A, that's minor. How helpful is that? Now, let's compare this to the C major scale. We can see very clearly how the difference between the major and the minor scale in this, in this example is purely the order of whole steps and half steps. So the minor would be whole, half, whole, whole, half, whole, whole, versus whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. And I said modal as if that was, a, you know, an inkling into a larger universe of things. That's because it is. That's as, as, um, as you know, the white keys from C to C and A to A are their own thing. The white keys from pretty much every note as a root isn't their own thing. And that's actually way more complicated and more intense than we're going to, you know, talk about today. But if you're interested in more interesting scale types, those are what they are. Thing, I mean, those are all have those little special names like Phrygian and Locrian and Aeolian and Ionian, Ionian and Mixolydian and all that stuff. Those are all, those are all um, what those are for. What those are from. So I'm going to move this on up to E because that's you know the, the, the key we like to write in. It's kind of like the the sort of like the the root key. But what I mean by that is that um, how far above it we go or how far below it we go tends to be determined. So that's more or less the average. In terms of the keys that people tend to write music in, in terms of, I mean, for our, you know, specific genres or whatever. Actually, metal uh, tends to be a little bit more widely ranged than that, just because bass isn't that important. I mean, it's, bass is the, as an instrument is pretty important, but bass in terms of sub-frequencies are not t aren't as important. As a result, we can do things like go down to A-sharp and not have to worry about the fact that the sub for that is super duper low and really hard to mix. But for electronic music, like... C or B is pretty hard in terms of bass mixing. And then like G is like a super like loud ultra sub because of the low the root sub for that is pretty high. And so it's really like in our face, that kind of thing. So that's the kind of logic that we, we consider when we talk about writing uh what key we're writing in, in terms of EDM. Alternatively, you could just ignore that and then do whatever you think sounds good. See how that works. Nice. So we have a scale. This is the minor scale. Yes, this is the minor scale. So I'm going to more or less be using this as my guideline. Now, this is kind of how this is how I approach this when I talk about when I talk about this with my students. I create this little scale line here, and um, I use this as like a reference throughout the rest, like throughout the writing process. Um, there's actually a cool thing you can do in um, 
the playlist option or the hell is it called the piano roll? Damn. If you go down to the drop down and go down the chord, is you have a whole list of stuff. And uh you can do like for example, there's also like a scale option, and here's a whole bunch of different scale types. And see here here's you know Dorian Phrygian, those are all the modes. And there's a whole bunch of other ones like you know, hold the whole tone scale or the blues scale. Dominant bebop. Nice. But um like if I went and got, you know, harmonic minor and I was like, boink, this would give us a, a particular kind of minor scale, which is not quite the same as regular minor scale. Uh, this is more like the kind of neoclassical thing where we have like a, a, a major seven right up until we go to the the, the, the one, I suppose, with a minor seven. And you can tell the difference between, you know, two of these. Uh, but of course, if you did that, then it's always just going to be what you put down. And you hit, if you hit shift N, it'll go back to being just a regular note. But that, I just I just want you to be aware of that as a tool, just so that if you ever know that you want a particular note or chord, but you don't necessarily remember how it's constructed, you can go and do that. But that's also why I told you about the A to A trick and the C to C trick, so that you have those two basic those two basic uh, scale types sort of at your fingertips. Yeah. So when you have a scale, when you have a scale like this, and you want to go about writing a progression, which is usually how music is from the fun the foundation by which music is based on. And I say, you know, sonically that's more or less true, but um, I'm not necessarily saying that you need to start with a progression because sometimes you have a melody in your head. Sometimes you have a drum beat in your head. It doesn't, I'm not, this is, none of these are hard and fast rules. Not, not, not any of them. This is just suggestions. So it's about, it's about a progression. Um, the, an easy one that I like to start out with, with for students is the four chords. Well, actually, I like, let's go down to the six because there's actually something I want to talk about the four uh, when we get to that because it's kind of interesting. Um, well, yeah, so we have a progression. Now, we, we the, the term a term comes to mind when people talk about think about progressions. They 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 think of the term chord progression, and this is the sense where we have our bass progression, and we want to have chords that go over it. Now, there are a lot more than just the chords I'm about to use, but these are the pretty these are the, the go to sort of starting chords. And these are the triads. And much like the name suggests, these are chords built of three notes. And as I kind of foreshadowed before, those three notes are the one, the three, and the five. One, three, five. In whatever scale you're in. Remember, we're in the minor scale. That's this guy. In fact, I'm just going to get rid of the major scale entirely. Minor scale. So, the chord progression. Now, when we make a progression, we make a chord out of whatever note we're on. That note becomes sort of like the new scale root. So when I say I make a one three five, I want to make a one three five for all these guys, but I'm not just going to put you know the three and the five of the scale on every single one because that's not that's not what I meant. I want to do the three and the five of all these individual ones. Let's see what that sounds like. Not quite right. Not necessarily wrong either. In fact, it's very reminiscent of a lot of like early house. But um, let's uh, let's t let's talk about why that didn't work quite work the way that we thought it would. We made a one three five, especially like the way that we did here with the one three and five. But as it turns out, we made a minor one three five on every single one of these guys, which intuitively might make sense because we're in a minor scale. But as it turns out, particular roots of particular parts of the scale are not necessarily always minor. Or always major here in a major, major scale. It can be either major or minor. Ooh. And how do you know which ones are which? Well, uh, if you look at if you look up any kind of music theory online, you'll probably see like a chart telling you which one's which. But a pretty easy way of helping out if you look at the notes and just check to see if the notes are in the scale. Like for example, A sharp, not so much. Now here's a here's something that's interesting. Let's consider for a second that we our options are to either put it at the B or the A because either of those are in the key. Is, especially if we just talk about like, well, the note's not in the key, so obviously the solution is put it in the key. But um, this is sort of where music theory gets a little interesting. And I, I, what I mean by that is that there are a lot of it, sort of rules that get thrown around to keep things to be certain things. So like, for example, when I said that I wanted to make triads over all these things, a triad is one, three, and five. That's what it is. And if I were to put it at the A, that's not a three anymore. That's a two. In fact, from a root note, there are only two possibilities to be a three. Normally, we have the minor three and the major three. 
Now, it's, what's interesting is that this is a particular. This is an interesting constraint. I, I, I'm just saying this so that you know that if you're if you're out of key in one particular way, that you, your options are to be either the minor or the major. And so, if it's the minor, it's wrong. Put it in the major. And if it's the major, it's wrong. Put it in the minor. That's all I want to say about that. But interesting kind of idea is that these are this this sort of constraint is born of a lot of like classical rules. I mean that in the, the actual truest sense of the term where um, they had a lot of formulaic-based music where things tend to be certain ways, and that's how it was if, you're, if you were doing a certain thing. But sometimes people wanted to have a little creative, a little creative flexing, and to do that, they, would, they, they you know, added things like the double flat, where let's say that I actually did want to have a two in there, but I still wanted it to be technically a triad. On sheet music, you would actually see it be in this position, only instead of being a B flat, a B flat, it would be a B double flat, just to kind of cheat the system. So even even you know the classical hard asses did the whole what sounds good to them shtick. They just justified it with weird stuff. This is also why I personally think that piano rolls is like the most just the best way to represent music. Because if you look like I said on sheet music, sheet music you can make this chord and this chord could be represented in like nine different ways. We look at the piano roll and it is only that. It is only that configuration that makes that that note. And so you're not it's not you're not confused as to what's happening. So let's do the same for all of these. Are you in a scale? Nope. Are you in a scale? Nope. Now let's have a listen. And you've got Mortal Kombat. So that's um, a pretty easy way to like we just essentially just stepped on a good chord progression. Like we can make stuff out of this. This is pretty much fine. Uh, you can. This is not very complicated. It's not very original. It's not very inventive, and it's but it's still catchy. You know, you can make stuff on this, and people will listen to it. It'll be fine. But um, if you want to get into more experimental stuff, uh, this is a good foundation. So then you know you, you got you can do things that you know works, and then you can work off of that to make things that might not work. But then eventually you will find something that does work in a very interesting way. And this is how you determine your own style. So now, now that we have a progression, let's. Uh, make a melody oh I'll, I'll hold on actually i want to make a point about the four so earlier i made the the four chords and when i when i say the four chords i really do mean the four chords like uh this particular progression of is just in so much music and there's, a, there's actually a um a band a group thing called the axis of awesome that had that has a song called had the song called the four so the f four score and seven years ago the four chord song and it's, it's it's just a medley of all the songs that use the chord, and it's really funny. Google it. YouTube it. It's funny. So I, now I made I the four here, and I made a triad using it, the one, three, and five, and he knows that the three is in the correct position. And while that technically works, actually it sort of sounds better to be major. Now, it's actually totally possible that I'm just not remembering theory enough to know that this is just supposed to be major. But based on the sort of the rules, quote unquote, that I just put in earlier about how you're trying to make a chord based out of the notes in your scale, uh, this doesn't really work. This is suddenly not it's not in the key anymore. But notice that it just sounds better to me anyway. It sounds better. So like you have those are the kind those are the kinds of uh, considerate. Those are the kinds of considerations you need to make when you're when you're working on this kind of stuff. So that, like, because, like, it's technically against the rules. Even though the rules aren't right, I could, again, just be wrong about this. But, like, even if they are against the rules, it still sounds good. So, like, don't worry about, you know, breaking stuff if it's stuff sounds fine when you do it. It's all, all, that, all the rest of that. Although, I will say, uh, well, in the next part where I put down melody lines, I'm going to put down a melody to by writing notes in the scale. That's what I'm going to do. And, but then if I put down notes in the scale and, like, I put down a C over this C sharp, and even notes that are C's are going to have to be C sharps to make sense. Otherwise, you'll get some cacophonous sort of disharmony. And sometimes that sounds good, but in my opinion, in that particular example, it does not. So let's go back to making this a, a six. Um, so anyway, yeah, melodies. Melodies are kind of easy. Because I said my sort of suggestion is a starting out melodies, especially if you don't already have one in mind is to just start on the tonic, start on the root note. You have your melody on the root note, and then you just dig around playing notes that are in the scale.
and whatever. Might not be particularly inventive, but it can be can sound interesting. Um, although I only made half of this because I want to show you a cool thing that happens when you do something called reharmonization. Reharmonization, if I'm correct in saying this, is where you have a line that you wrote over a particular progression, and then you have the same line over a different progression. In this case, the two different chords. So well, actually, I want to demonstrate what happens with the, with the with the four. This particular note didn't quite work out that well, but now it does, in my opinion. I'm using this dopey sound just so that I can talk and you can hear it and it won't be damaging anybody's ears. Um, yeah. Now this. The amount of information that has got us to this point is enough to get you on your way to making songs. Your way to making songs. Because you have a song ray. Yes. I'm going with that. And um, there's a lot more advanced stuff. There's a lot more. There's more. Way more. There's a lot more rules to help you create new stuff. And like practically everything to do with old like classical music has been formula formulized to the point where if you want to do something that sounds classic-y, or like a particular composer, I guarantee you there are theory rules to generate it. And if you can find them, you can use them. It's pretty cool. There's also the entirety of jazz music theory, which I didn't, I didn't touch at all in here. And there's a lot of neat stuff in there, like the idea of the seven chord, which is a one, a three, a five, and a seven. And you get... And using those as, as your progression sort of opens up a lot of very interesting like places you can go with that. And that's a lot more complicated, and it's a lot it is a lot harder. But um, if you're into that kind of stuff, that's where I recommend you go look. Now, I will leave you with one more suggestion about how you can kind of like help your ear. And what I mean by this is, um, well, I'm essentially going to tell you to go do something called ear training. Ear training is a process by which um, you can be played an interval, and an interval is two any any you know there's a note and another note, and then the distance between the two is referred to as the interval. So like, you know, we have this this one, three, five example here. We have the one and the three, and that's a, a third. The one and the five, and that's a fifth. And like, that's that's what I mean by the ear trading idea. And so like when, um, when I, if I were to like hear this this melody uh, from, and I didn't write it, and I just hear, heard it, I would actually be able to put it down, transcribe it pretty quickly because I've done, A, I've done this for a long time, and B, because I did something called ear trading where I'm able to identify what they are. And sort of what, how this works is that I'm not necessarily, like, one way to do it is to sort of read the interval between each consecutive note. And you can do that, but really what I do is I, I kind of, I, I find the tonic, and then I judge the interval from every note and the tonic. So the first note's a one, next one's a two, because it's a second from the, the tonic. Next one's a three, because it's a second from the tonic. That, and then, you know, seven, because it's a seven from tonic, tonic, that kind of thing. Or a two below a tonic, you can have that, uh, that in your head as well. Um... Cause like I say that it's a it's a seven, but like I know that if I were to hit those two notes, that's a that's a two. But like the the tonic I'm I'm the the interval I'm actually hearing is that kind of thing. So ear trading essentially trains you to do this. Um, there is a website I will link in the description of this video. It's, it's actually a little ear it's an online browser based ear trading exercise where it'll play you intervals. And then you have to guess what they are. The intervals um, are pretty self-explanatory, but I'll, I'll describe what they are right there right now. You have this first one. This is a minor second. And you have a minor, a major second. Minor second. Major second. And a minor third. And a major third. A perfect fourth. tritone or an augmented fourth or a diminished fifth a perfect fifth a minor six or an augmented fifth a major six a minor seven a major seven an octave 
There's also a unison where it's essentially two notes together, but that's not really relevant to your interests. So these are essentially all the intervals that you'll ever care about. And you, you, you notice how it you know, made sense until we got the idea of the, the perfect fourth and the perfect fifth and the augmented and diminished, these kinds of things. This is because, for some reason, there are no major, uh, there's no major or minor fourths or major or minor fifths. There's augmented and diminished fifths, and they are also related to other other intervals. So, like, you know, except for the tritone. The tritone, that's why it's called a tritone. A very interesting chord. Also call it the devil's interval or something. It had it's some evil sounding thing. It's pretty prevalent in metal. Um, but yeah, you get the you get these intervals to choose from on this on this browser based thing, and it essentially gives you randomized uh, intervals, both playing like from the bottom and then or playing from the top, and essentially you're hearing for what they are, and then you identify them, and you just can just do that forever. You just keep doing it until eventually you just can get them all. Um, it won't take you that long, like, uh, especially if you've, if you've worked in music, like worked in writing music as like, you know, your thing, a lot of this is going to be stuff that you knew kind of, but you didn't really have a name to. So like this, now you're just putting a name to it and it should be pretty cool. It should be pretty easy. The benefit of doing this is that, um, this lets you do two things. This lets you hear a melody, like from the, someone else has done or a progression and being able to know what it is and then put it down yourself. And the second thing is to hear a melody or progression in your brain and then put it down yourself, which is like the one, the one, the, the biggest request of any student who's ever done music for me, for anyone else, and even myself, is how do I write something that I hear in my head? And this is how you do it. Well, it's a way of doing it. Yeah, so this is essentially as far as I go in terms of music theory coaching on my own private lessons. It's not very far, but it's far enough. This is uh, honestly all of the... Um, this is all the real information that I use in my own work. Like, I, and then, I, you know, that, I, that I'm able to actually identify as being a thing that I do. And then, you know, I'll do stuff like move things around until they sound good apart from, and just ignoring whatever rule I'm doing. But a part, also part of um, the year training and also like putting names and stuff is that when you do do things that were not based on rules, you can identify what you did so that you can do it again later. That's also a big part of this. Anyway, um, yeah, so that was the music theory spiel. Uh, if you have any questions about this, let me know. I also encourage you to go and watch Varian's music theory tutorials. I encourage you to do the ear training exercise on the website. I'm going to link in the description of this video. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. And as usual, have a nice day.